thank you for being on time, being a little bit early. It's great. And um, it's wonderful that you've joined us for, for wherever you are. Hope you are safe and healthy and all those things that are so important, uh, especially right now. Another thing about today, which Emily just notified me about, we have people all around the world. So welcome to you if you're in New Zealand or in Chile, our regulars from Uruguay and Argentina and a bunch of people from the UK. Uh, so it's wonderful that you're all joining us here. It's, it's, this is our community and welcome to it. So um, welcome, I'm Michael Kerman from Leading Edge Seminars. I'm in Toronto. And I'm working with Emily Porter, who you may see on your Zoom screen, who is our trusty uh, do everything person. You might also see Bruce Ecker, who is our special virtual lunch guest today. Now, our virtual lunches are kind of getting to know you. Some of you might know Bruce or some of our other uh, virtual lunch guests. Some of you may not. So it's really a way to kind of dig into their past. It's kind of just a way to get to know people, uh, talk a little bit about uh, coherence therapy, obviously with Bruce. And then we're going to open up for questions um, for about the last 20 to 20, 20 to 30 minutes. There are questions um, that you can ask on your Zoom screen. Um, so first, a few things about what we're coming up. We've kind of had a slow summer in terms of doing things live or having webinars because we figured everyone needed a break, including us. We do have a couple of virtual lunches. Those are the next two events. They're free and you can register for them. Actually, Emily will send you a link along with this video when, uh, by tomorrow sometime. On August 24th, we have Mary Casamano, who you may not know, but she's been a lead researcher in John Hopkins in their work in psilocybin and psychedelic assisted therapy. She's led over 450 sessions for almost 15 years. And there's been a lot of talk about the promise of psychedelic assisted therapy. And Mary's gonna be here to share her experiences in her life in that world. And that's August 24th. Um, there is someone coming up September 9th that I think many of the, you do know, Sue Johnson, who one of the developers of Emotionally Focused Therapy. And Sue will be here on September 9th for a virtual lunch. Uh, later in September, all our regular webinars are beginning again. If you've joined us before, you know they're generally three hours uh, with question and answers. We have a whole series on sex called Speaking of Sex, starting off with Sue Iannicenza. Uh, we have Bill O'Hanlon talking about book writing. If you ever thought about you wanted to uh, write a book. And the other thing you'll be hearing more about is we are offering uh, four one-week programs in Cancun in February, all things being equal with COVID, at a beautiful resort where our presenters, uh, including Bessel van der Kolk, Ron Siegel, Diana Fosha, lots of people you may know are presenting in the morning and the rest of the time will be playtime and interesting time with others in Cancun in February. Emily will also send you that link. So Emily is our trust our trusted hostess with the most this you may see on the screen if you have questions i'll put them in the chat box and emily will call people to the screen of course we love to see faces so if you uh feel comfortable or able to ask your question directly to bruce uh you're certainly invited to do that also if you have any technical problems or anything else go to the chat line and emily will can help you out. Everything we do, including today, is archived, which means well, this is recorded and you will get it later, most likely by tomorrow. It's always true. So if you sign up for something large, you, you, you might not know, oh, I can't make it, but I want to see it. I know there are a lot of people who signed up for today who are probably in that situation. Everyone receives a link when it's done. So um, let me tell you something about Bruce and a little bit about what he will be doing with us later on. So Bruce Ecker is the co-originator co and the developer of Coherence Therapy. And he's the, he's the co-author of a couple of books, which we're going to talk about a little bit. The first one was, was uh, written in the 90s and received a lot of interest in the therapy field. The title was most interesting, Depth-Oriented Brief Therapy, How to Be Brief When You Are Trained to Be Deep and vice versa. And then it was followed later on by his very popular unliking, un unlocking the emotional brain, uh, eliminating the symptoms at their roots using memory reconsolidation. And uh, 
the central theme of, of Bruce Ecker's work has been the clarification of the ingredients of profound clinical change and giving equal emphasis to both compassion, understanding of emotional truth, and to rigorous scientific thinking that led him and his collaborator, Lori, uh, Laurel Hulley, to identify a natural core process of profound change across a wide range of client symptoms, issues, and personalities. This has been, this has been known as coherence therapy, and we're going to dig in, into that today. So since actually 2006, he's driven the clinical field's recognition of memory reconsolidation as a core process of transformational change. And uh, again, his Co Coherence Therapy Institute is in New York City. He's trained a lot of people. He does a lot of training. And one thing that I found you know, so refreshing is that, uh, as Bruce will tell you, he's looking at how people change, not using one particular therapy. And he looked at the similarities between different, uh, different kinds of therapies. And his approach lets you keep the therapy you've been trained in and add on some really deep understanding of how people uh, consolidate their memory and what it means for therapeutic change. So Bruce, thank you very much for, for joining us. He will, Bruce, by the way, will be joining us for something we haven't done before. Instead of presenting a live webinar, you will have access to Bruce's uh, uh, training uh, uh, anytime on demand between September 14th and October 19th. And then when you sign up with us, you'll get his 93 page coherence therapy practice manual and an opportunity to participate in a question and answer about that training on October the 20th. So uh, we'll send you that information uh, later on. And we're very happy that Bruce is doing that for us next month and happy Bruce that you're here today. So welcome Bruce, thank you for joining us. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here too. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. Okay, so what I thought I'd do, and I just mentioned this to Bruce of two minutes before I went on, is I thought it'd be interesting to have a series of origin stories, like who is this Bruce Ecker guy? How did he get to where he is now? And take through different peri periods of your life, Bruce, um, starting off with uh, your life before you be became so interested in psychotherapy, where you went to university, what you were studying, and what your life looked like as a young man. Wow. All right. Here we go. We don't have to spend the whole hour on that, but we'll start there. I'll try and keep it succinct. Um, uh, my trip through memory lane. Uh, first, hello to everyone who's here. Thank you for coming. It's great to see all your faces up there on the Zoom window from all over the world. Wow. Um, well, okay. Um, gee. I'm trying to remember the range of items you just listed there, Michael. And I think I'll start with um, the very early, um, well, you know, I went into physics. I was a research physicist first. Uh, and for 14 years, I did that in a, in a laboratory in a company. And uh, I, my real motivation in studying physics in college and then be, becoming a physicist was uh, a, a, a really a strong appetite for seeing into uh, the, the heart of reality. I, I really wanted to know what's at the core of reality, existence. And I thought physics could help me get in on that and uh, tried and found uh, that it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. Um, that was a big disappointment. What it does is create wonderful mathematical models and equations that describe and predict phenomena with amazing uh, accuracy without ever telling you why things are the way they are, actually. So it didn't satisfy my hunger for a, a, a look into uh, you know, what is, what, what's happening here? What, what is existence and what's going on? Um, so after about 14 years, I was uh, done with that line of work and looking for another. And it took me quite a few years really to keep searching and winding up aiming for doing psychotherapy. And for me, that was a switch from uh, the, uh, the objective focus on the world uh, what makes things tick to the subjective 
focus. I thought that perhaps looking into subjectivity and consciousness and what's going on in people might actually be a more direct path to the heart of reality, because I had begun reading widely in various uh, wisdom traditions, you could say, or spiritual frameworks from around the world, and they all pointed in that direction. So uh, I also needed a new career, so I had to do something uh, that was uh, a, a viable line of work. And finally, I arrived at training to be a psychotherapist. So that's maybe the first chapter of the, of the, of the tale. The next comes uh, <clears throat> when it's the early years of actually uh, being in, in therapy practice <clears throat> after graduate school and getting the necessary credentials. And uh, Laurel Hulley and I had teamed up and she too was in her early years of doing therapy. And after uh, you know a year or two, uh, we noticed that very occasionally, <clears throat> and I emphasize very occasionally, a client would uh, report a profound change, uh, a longstanding intense symptom or experience would simply stop happening and not come back. And we were very struck by that, even just the first one or two times, like, whoa, how did that happen? And we decided that it, given that that was possible, uh, given that we saw that it was possible, it wasn't a theoretical idea. Um, we wanted to figure out how to make therapy do that more reliably, since it's possible. The, the, the norm in the therapy field was, and largely still is, uh, gradual incremental change, right? And uh, most of the uh, field of psychotherapy outcome research is focused on that kind of change almost entirely. So that really is what therapists expect, but we have seen this remarkable quality of change happen. So we, we, we headed in that direction and <clears throat> studied very closely every uh, instance of that in our practices. And like I said, they weren't very frequent. So it took uh, quite a few years before we could micro-examine enough of those uh, instances in our own practices to identify what, what did they all have in common across different kinds of symptoms, whether behavior symptoms, mood symptoms, cognitive symptoms. Um, we finally did identify a certain set of experiences that every one of these profound change, or as we came to call it, transformational change uh, instances had in common. And on that basis, we wrote that book whose title you mentioned, Michael, Depth-Oriented Brief Therapy, published in, uh, I think, late 1995. And we reported and described with many case examples that process and what it looks like applied to many different clients, many different personalities, many different symptoms. And interestingly, applied with many different techniques because the process we had identified consisted of a set of three experiences experiences, experiences of certain types put together uh, result in profound change as we had identified the process. And those experiences can be created with a vast range, unlimited range of techniques. And to explain the distinction between techniques or procedures versus types of experiences, I like to simply say, you know, imagine if you were um, Imagine if you were given the task of making someone laugh. You have to make someone laugh and you're gonna be sat down with somebody and you're gonna make them laugh. And the sooner you can get them to laugh, the higher your score in this uh, hypothetical research study you're involved in. Well, if you looked at a hundred different participants in this study and how they made the other person laugh, you'd see a large number of different techniques for getting somebody to laugh, but they all created the same type of experience. The other person laughing is the experience that was created. So I think that makes it clear what we mean by saying that when you identify certain types of experience, it's unlimited how many different concrete procedures or techniques you can uh, use to create the experiences. 
So the three experiences that we found that are always involved in producing transformational change where a, uh, a particular symptom disappears permanently and the accompanying ego state or emotional reactivation that accompanies that symptom also disappears. Uh, therapists have so many different terms for these things, ego state, um, part, subpersonality, schema, um, also disappears along with the symptom. And, and, and when I say disappears, I mean nothing further needs to be done to maintain uh, the person being free of the symptom or the, the schema or ego state. It's that stable and uh, robust. So uh, the three uh, experiences consist of uh, activating or reactivating really, uh, the state in which the symptom happens. Uh, and that's usually easy to do just by uh, guiding the client to focus on a recent instance when it happened. Oh yeah, my brother walked in the room and said X, Y, Z, a cue in other words, contextual or concrete cue that reactivates. <clears throat> and the second experience is the the recognition, the experiential embodied recognition of what is the emotional learning that the client carries from earlier in life that is actually what's reactivating. For example, uh, I, I'll stick with the example I just started using. My brother walks in the room. Uh, okay, and what I know is that if I reveal any personal vulnerability or a feeling of fear or sadness or hurt or need, my brother will aggressively humiliate and shame me for that. I know that. Now that's the kind of stuff that is so life organizing in a person's life. But as all of you know, I'm sure, amazingly, people go through their lives unaware of these particular emotional learnings and the implicit knowings and expectations they consist of, such as if I reveal anything vulnerable or tender or soft, um, that's considered weakness in our family, and my brother will shame and humiliate me. And that'll be a grueling experience. So I better, I better lock up and not feel anything uh, when I'm around the family or around him in particular. Now, I just spelled out what's in the emotional learning or the schema. Um, uh, but people are not conscious of that material. The second experience that we found is crucial is to bring the client into direct awareness of that specific emotional learning contents that is generating the symptoms, uh, both as a felt full whole body affective experience, but also with the words that label and make the material very explicit. That's the second experience. The third experience and the one that drives profound change, transformational change, is that while the person is in touch with this schema and ego state, to also induce concurrently an experience of something the client knows because of having experienced it themselves, that decisively contradicts and disconfirms what that symptom generating schema knows and expects. And when you guide the person, the client, to hold both at once, and this is the crucial piece, we call it a juxtaposition experience. Holding the knowings and expectations, feelings, knowings, all the images, whatever it's made of, holding that schema, that symptom generating schema as an emotional truth, and at the same time holding uh, in the same field of view, anything that is real and true to the client, not just positive thinking, not just a preferred belief, but a real knowing that's, uh, that has realness for the client of, of anything that decisively uh, contradicts and disconfirms crucial material in that schema. That, 
is the set of experiences that brings about transformational change. We've seen it in every case back then and in the decades ever since, it's quite consistent. And all of our writings and, and case examples are uh, illustrate that from different angles. So that's what we found uh, by about uh, the late 1980s, we uh, early 1990s, we had recognized that stuff, started writing the, the depth oriented brief therapy book in around 1993, and it was published late 1995. And, uh, you know, uh, began teaching and presenting. And that was the name of the approach back then depth oriented brief therapy. Well, fast forward a few years to the next phase of this story. <clears throat> it was uh, in 2005 that I and some colleagues became interested in looking at uh, whether anything has been found by neuroscience researchers, brain researchers, that corresponds to this process uh, of three experiences and the kind of change it produces because the process is so well-defined and the result is so distinctive that we began to think, you know, it's very possible that neuroscience memory researchers may have found something that corresponds to this in the brain. So we began uh, searching through neuroscience research articles in uh, research journals. And that search, we, we went through hundreds of studies, nothing seemed to match. <clears throat> and then Laurel Hulley and I were, uh, were, uh, uh, we, we, were we were married uh, and, and, and had children and we were in need of a vacation. So uh, 2005, around uh, November, we went uh, to, uh, <clears throat> we were living up in the San Francisco Bay Area in Oakland. And so we went down to San Luis Obispo down the coast for a, a long weekend vacation. Um, spent several days walking around in Hearst Castle down there. Amazing. Um, um, and so uh, it was late one night uh, in our motel room um, when I was uh, at the computer that the hotel room conveniently provided. Um, and searching, continuing the search, I was, I was kind of obsessed with this search at this point. So there I was doing it again during, during the vacation, uh, when time allowed, uh, around midnight, uh, one night, Laurel's, uh, reading her, her uh, vacation novel, which I like to point out in her case was, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, the brothers Karamazov, I think it was. And uh, she's sitting there reading, and I'm sitting at the at the computer, searching, searching, and and uh, all of a sudden, there in front of me was a neuroscience research article that absolutely matched the set of experiences we had found, and the authors were describing something called memory reconsolidation, which I'd never heard of. And, uh, you know, I felt a thrill of energy ripple through my midline. And in fact, I have to tell you, I'm feeling it again right now as I'm sharing this with you. It's one of the most extraordinary, delightful, and thrilling experiences I've had in my life to find uh, empirical uh, science, well established, rigorously done science that absolutely confirmed and matched what we had. Uh, culled from our clinical observations, which of course, you know, from the point of view of researchers, that's merely anecdotal accounts and hardly counts for anything. Um, so here was the bridge to hard science. And, you know, I had been a physicist for 14 years and I, I, I really respect and value science. I see its limitations, um, uh, but uh, it's, it, it's important. And to, to find a bridge to, to the neuroscience corresponding to what we found was, was meaningful and a joy to me. And it opened up a whole new chapter in, in our work. Uh, so in other words, we began uh, importing, bringing the neuroscience research in that, that was you know, locked in these highly technical journals at that point 
and not many studies at that point either. Uh, 2005 is only uh, five years after um, memory recons, a, a cluster of, of three or four studies were published in the 1997 to 2000 period that were the first detections of this, um, uh, identifying this process called memory reconsolidation. Now, there had been a few anomalies published back in the 60s and 70s, where some researchers had achieved profound change through the same process, but using things like electroconvulsive techniques and uh, and no one knew how to make sense of these anomalies. And it was lost sight of for about 20 to 30 years until uh, from 1997 to 2000, a few researchers uh, uh, achieved the same kinds of results and would now with more sophisticated techniques that identified this neurological process where uh, the encoding of an emotional learning is uh, <clears throat> neurophysiologically change, the actual synaptic encoding, uh, or as researchers call it, the engram, the engram meaning the entire set of uh, synapses and whatever else encodes memory, because it seems to be not only synapses, the engram is uh, destabilized in this memory reconsolidation process. So it's an actual physical and chemical change in the, in the engram, <clears throat> the encoding, that uh, shifts the, the encoding from a stable, uh, unchangeable form into a, what they call a destabilized condition. And, and that lasts for about five hours. But after six hours, it's restabilized, the researchers had found. But during that period of a few hours, that encoding is uh, susceptible to being directly updated and re-encoded, rewritten by new experiences during that period. They call it the reconsolidation window. Uh, new experiences that drive updating of the, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the emotional learning contents as it had been. Um, so ever since then, uh, our work has been focused on uh, bringing this, this knowledge into the psychotherapy field uh, and showing how many different systems of therapy actually have this process embedded in their methodology. Even though uh, most of these therapies don't name this set of experiences, in defining their methodology or their concepts. But what we've done in the book we published in 2012, uh, the book you mentioned, Michael, Unlocking the Emotional Brain, uh, we, we take a very close look at previously published case examples uh, from four different therapies. Uh, it's uh, AEDP, EMDR, emotion-focused therapy, and interpersonal neurobiology. And we show in these close re-examinations of uh, case examples from those therapies that this set of three experiences happens in, in the account of the therapy. See, here it is, here it is, here it is in each case, um, as well as giving uh, many examples from coherence therapy throughout the book that um, we use to illustrate the process for teaching purposes, because in coherence therapy, the three experiences are explicitly named and the therapist is set up to aim for creating those experiences. So for teaching purposes, coherence therapy case examples are particularly useful, but we, we make a big point of showing how um, many different experiential focused in-depth therapies do this. And at this point we have, I think 10 or 11 such documentations in publications uh, outside of the book since then. Um, so <clears throat> let's see, Michael, have I, have I, Taking well, the tour of follow, no, this is great. I don't want to follow up with a question because Good. you looked at those four therapies, and now your own coherence therapy institute has a lot of examples, and you published on you know range from depression to couples therapy. So I'm going to ask you just to give one case example, 
that you think would best exemplify memory reconsolidation in, in a client either you work with or, or for one of the therapies that you sure. study? Sure. Okay, good. And then we'll open for questions, by the way. Again, good. if you weren't here, if you have a question, put it in the chat line. Emily will be calling people shortly. Okay. All right. Here goes. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll use a case example that is, uh, I think, a very good example, and it's very deep, uh, but, it's, but it's short enough to do in a situation like this. Uh, one of my clients, a woman in her 50s, I call her Marina, not her real name, and um, she had been working on various problem patterns. And then she brought up one I had not heard of. And she described how for her whole life, since childhood, she uh, is very prone to going into an angry, resentful mood. And she gets stuck in that angry, resentful mood for sometimes days at a time. And it has been a major negative effect on her 28-year marriage. So it's a, it's a major problem. And one that she's mystified by. She has no idea why this takes her over uh, so, so dominantly throughout her life. Okay, so here's a, as short as possible. I'll try to whip through how things unfolded. I, um, I asked her, uh, what in your life do you resent the most? So I'm heading for bringing out the emotional learning, whatever it is, I have no idea, uh, that's generating this anger resentment response. <clears throat> uh, as well as I can, I'm going to try and head for that. So what in your whole life do you resent the most? She said, well, I, I know what it is. Um, my grandfather molested me starting at age six. And I did lots of therapy about that years ago. Okay, so I kept Burrowing in. All right. What about that ordeal do you resent the most? Now, that question, she didn't have a, an immediate answer for. Apparently, that question went to an area that her therapy hadn't quite focused on, that kind of specificity. And specificity is a huge, huge factor in this process being done efficiently and successfully. Um, so she sat there trying to look in and find what about that ordeal does she resent the most? And after a long silence, she said, you know, it, it's, it doesn't feel like it's my grandfather himself. She was a little surprised. You could, I could tell from the tone in her voice. And she kept looking and she said, you know, it feels like I resent life itself for that the most. She was surprised. I was surprised. And, but I kept burrowing in. Okay, what is it about life itself that makes life itself what you resent the most? I, I'm just guiding her attention to go to where the implicit knowledge is, right? Uh, conscious attention never goes there, but it can in minutes. And that's what we do. So she was focusing on that. And she said, let's see, let me see if I can remember her exact words. My, my written versions of this have her exact words. Um, she said, it's, why would, why would life let this happen to me and to nobody else? Those are, that's very close to her exact words. I was, I was amazed at what I was hearing. She, to her, it was not amazing. It was just her truth. That's what I realized as soon as I heard those words, that as a six-year-old girl, that is how she construed what she was suffering. She'd never heard of such a thing as a grown-up touching a child this way. No one ever talked about it. It seemed to her that this happened to her and to no other child in the world. And that's how it landed and was... Uh, uh, understood inside of her, that life had let this happen to her and no one else. And so immediately I understood the basis of her anger and resentment, that whenever any situation ever since looks and feels like I'm being mistreated by life, it activates this same unresolved anger and resentment at life. A deep, 
profound, ever simmering anger and resentment. So in married life, you know, feeling mistreated and 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 being arbitrarily uh, put through trouble or suffering, you know, happens pretty often. It's just a normal part of life, isn't it? But for her, it always triggers this. And that's why this uh, mood reaction had been happening throughout her life. Now, another thing was uh, immediately apparent to me as soon as I heard this from her and understood it. I immediately saw how I could uh, have her access and feel a contradictory knowledge that will disconfirm that emotional learning. Uh, there are many different techniques that we've identified and teach for guiding a client to find the needed contradictory knowledge. And we have all that written up in various things, places. So this is just one example of one of them, not the general pattern for how to find contradictory knowledge. Um, however, this is the technique that is most often effective and that we tend to use first, see if it works. I said to Norena, say it to me again. <clears throat> it happened only to me. She looked at me and said it again. It happened only to me. And the look on her face and the tone of voice, I could see that it still just felt the truth of the universe to her, right? It, it happened only to me. I said, yeah, okay, good. Say it to me again. And she said, it happened only to me. And now the look on her face was a little different. Didn't have that conviction and that indignance, right? The indignance of that. Uh, her face had a softer look, and I knew that what I was aiming for was starting to work. I said, say it again. She said, it happened only to me. And now her eyes started darting around and a look of, and again, I get a little, uh, <laughs> uh, a certain excitement that I felt then comes back to me now, uh, I, she, a look of amazement. Sheer amazement came over her face. Surprise, surprise. Her face opened up and she said, and these are her exact words. Oh my God, I really thought it happened only to me. Her adult knowledge that it happens to children everywhere lit up in juxtaposition with it happened only to me. And in seconds, the lifelong realness of it happened only to me was drained out and gone, unlearned, unlearned. This is true unlearning, not just the setting up of a preferred positive belief that competes against the problematic learning. No, this is direct, actual, profound unlearning and rewriting of the original learning. And she, and she spontaneously kept saying, it didn't happen to only to me. It happens to children everywhere. It happens to girls and boys too, she said, everywhere. It's an ugly truth of life, but it's a truth. Oh my God. Um, I'll just cut to the bottom line. That anger and resentment reaction stopped happening as of that session. And I tracked with her because we kept working on other things. Eight, the best, the best follow-up was eight months later, she came in and said, boy, things between my husband and I were difficult this month. We were meeting monthly at that point. She said, there was real trouble with the extended family and my husband and I could not get on the same page dealing with it. So there were real strains between us, but I never went into that angry, resentful mood. Not once. In fact, I feel great, even with all that trouble. So I hope that example captures the, the deliberate creation of those three experiences and the power of that process for creating transformation and change. That is a very moving story. It uh, is. For everyone, uh, very moving. Okay, I had other questions, but I think I'd like to open it up um, because Good. we have a lot of people. Thank you all for being here and joining us on this call. 
And now it's your opportunity. Uh, Emily, do we have some questions? We do. Take it away. Um, the first couple were asking um, about a bibliography for your findings related to the different types of therapies you've mentioned. Okay, um, good. On our website, which is um, simplest would be uh, coherenceinstitute.org. Okay, w one word as usual, coherenceinstitute.org. Uh, on the home page, you'll see a box. Uh, I think it's quick links on memory reconsolidation. There's a list of six or seven quick links there. And one of them is a link to a page that lists all 10 or 11 of those um, case examples that show different therapies carrying out the process. Thank you. Um, we also have a, que we have a question from Sean. Sean, did you want to want to unmute and ask for your questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, Sean. Hi, Mr. Eckert. I came, first came across uh, coherence therapy when I was trying to figure out how to change my own experience with agoraphobia. Mm. This was a couple of years ago, and I came across it, and it made so much sense. So I just started applying it. And ever since, I have been waiting for the opportunity to possibly ask you questions so thank you uh, to Leading Edge Seminars for making this possible. <laughs> I jumped out of bed today excited. So uh -oh. with, all, with all that said, um, I actually have, I couldn't just pick one. So if I could ask you two, and maybe you could pick the one that seems most interesting to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the first one was, is there a particular emotional habit that a person can do on a consistent basis that would help them to naturally unlearn some of these emotional schemas, say they can't, you know, go to therapy, and it, it's something they want to consistently do. And I, I kind of have my suspicions as to what it could be, but I'd love to hear your feedback. So that's the first one. And then the second question or option would be, um, I've been using EFT tapping really effectively um, with clients. And I was wondering if there's a way, if you're familiar with it, and if you are, is there a way that I can use the coherence therapy uh, process that comes to mind to make that even more effective for people? Okay, let me see. All right. The second one, I'll, I'll maybe both quickly, uh, but the okay. second one, yeah, I know coherence therapy practitioners who incorporate tapping within the process uh, at least to... Uh, help e e elicit the schema, the emotional learning involved. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, coherence therapy practitioners uh, widely understand that uh, coherence therapy and EMDR go together seamlessly too. And people use eye movements or other bilateral stimulations within coherence th therapy, at least to help bring out the schema when other methods uh, that are more verbal have not been effectively doing it. Uh, these, these tapping or bilateral stimulations, as you know, are such uh, nonverbal and often effective ways to make material show up that's outside of awareness. Um, uh, let's see, is, uh, is that enough of an answer about tapping? Yeah, I had my suspicion that using the tapping to kind of um, settle the emotional you know, experience that they're having would actually bring up the next emotional experience that maybe that one was. It, it can produce the entire process if it's done skillfully. Um, I, I, I recommend David Feinstein's writings. Uh, David and I have been talking about the, 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 the memory reconsolidation process for years. He's very fond of the process as we map it out and his writings about energy psychology, including tapping, uh, uh, many of his writings uh, map out the tapping and other energy psychology methods in terms of memory reconsolidation. So I think you'll find a lot relevant to your interest in David's writings. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, in terms of a habit or a, a general practice that lay people, non-therapists can use, well, no, anybody, I think you meant, can use to self-administer the process, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what you mean. That's tricky. That's tricky. Um, 
I had been thinking about this again because I thought about this in several phases for decades. Is it possible to set up people to self-administer this? Uh, it can be done if, if you're familiar enough with the process and you're uh, comfortable enough with self-awareness of uncomfortable material, you can do it. I, I do it and I know other people who, who do it. However, uh, just funny you mentioned this, just in the last week or two, somebody else brought this up. So I've been, I've been looking at my own sessions with an eye to, could this person have done this on their own? And so many of my sessions, the answer is no. Because here's the reason. The material that needs to be accessed for this process to be effective in a large fraction of cases is intensely distressing material. Right, the original emotional learnings uh, uh, have a lot in them that's intensely distressing, happened in intensely distressing experiences earlier in life or childhood. And the therapist's empathic accompaniment, close accompaniment, while, like I did with Narina, right? Mm -hmm. While the accessing is happening is a crucial catalyst that enables the person to do it. Doing it alone is too scary, too painful, too going out of control into really distressing stuff for people to do alone. And that is the case in a large fraction of my cases. Yeah, that uh, uh, At the end of some sessions, when we've gone into very distressing material, uh, I say to the client, now look, how is it gonna be for you when we finish the session uh, how is it going to be for you between sessions being alone with this stuff? Does that feel comfortable to you to anticipate right now? If there is the slightest hesitation, I tell the client, then not yet. Let it slide back into the dark for now. I'll bring us back to it when we're together again next time. And the client always says, okay, good. <laughs> Whenever there's been the slightest hesitation. And after going back to the material two or three times in subsequent sessions, then the client finally does feel fine about being with it alone between sessions. So, you know, I wish I could find a way or, uh, yeah, to, to make this more widely teachable for self-administering, but uh, I don't think so. It's, it's very spotty for self-administering. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, Thank you're you. welcome, Sean. Nice to connect with you here. Nice to connect with you too. Yeah. Emily, I think you're muted. Sorry, back up mute was on. Um, someone was wondering if there are any US or any university psychologist programs that work with coherence therapy. Uh, there are. The one I'm top of mind aware of is the uh, course in coherence therapy taught at the University of Memphis by my co-director of the Coherent Psychology Institute, Dr. Sarah Bridges. Um, she teaches uh, a, a, a doctoral level, doctoral program course, uh, experiential course in coherence therapy. And those of her doctoral students who focus on the coherence oriented approach she ushers through the program, uh, supporting them with that focus. Um, uh, you know, I don't have others in mind that I could mention, uh, okay. uh, but I hope that's enough of an initial response about that. Thank you. Um, another question is, in traditional talk therapy, there are at times some very positive life change, ch life changing outcomes, even if these sessions do not follow a strict memory recon uh, reconsolidation process. Uh, in those circumstances, what would you say is the possible component that provides the juxtaposition? Uh, is it the unconditional positive regard, the sense of safety, the warmth, or the ritual of the office, or do you have any other suggestions? Uh, well, good question. And I've thought about this over the years, too. Uh, and my understanding at this point is that there is no one general answer to that question. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, specificity is a very important factor in this process. The, uh, everybody has unique emotional learning histories. 
everybody's implicit schemas, these packets of specific learning, as such as I exemplified earlier in, in my comments, each person's are made of unique material, even if there are general similarities. And the, the disconfirmation through contradictory knowledge needs to be highly specific to the specific contents of this individual's material. Uh, in fact, some of our case, some of our writings were, have been designed to show, uh, look, here are two clients whose presentation of depression seem very similar. But then when we compare the underlying emotional learnings or schemas maintaining that depression, wow, the contents are quite different. Um, so there's no general answer to that question. And uh, another comment relevant, I think, in response to that question is, the relation, the, 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 the non-specific common factors, right? The quality of the alliance, the therapist's empathy, the comfort, the safety of being there in the therapist's office with the therapist. Those factors play different roles in different therapies. I don't, I don't mean different therapy systems. I mean, with different clients for different schemas. Those factors can play different roles in bringing about change for different schemas of the same client. And very briefly, here's what I mean. Those factors, um, and, and we've written about this in, in some of our writings, we, we've shown that there are schemas whose content makes it impossible for the client's experience of the therapist to disconfirm because the contents of the schema have nothing to do with any of that, right? Uh, a quick example, I had a client who had a schema consisting of the knowledge, if I do anything that I want, if I pursue what I want, the world will crush it and rip that away from me permanently. So I better not ever again try with all my heart for what I want or even know what I really want, okay? You can imagine the range of symptoms that that schema was generating. This schema was learned at the end of high school when he was a star athlete in high school and had already had a scholarship to a big university and was his whole identity was in this and his whole identity was wrapped up in his future glory as a college star athlete, right? And at the very end of high school, training for his last track meet, he has trouble with his legs and what's discovered is a serious bone disease, not, not a malignancy, but a serious bone disease that wipes out his athletic career permanently and for life, which was a stunning and traumatic loss for him in ways that never were addressed or, 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 or dealt with. So it was all raw, unprocessed uh, trauma and loss. And he formed that learning that, I, that, that came into words in the therapy. Uh, if, I, if I try for what I want, life will crush it. I better not ever try for or even know or feel what I really want. That schema could not possibly be disconfirmed by his experience of the therapist's empathy and safety. It's an existential schema. Many emotional learnings are formed in domains of experience outside of human relationship. Schemas that are formed in relationship, attachment-based schemas, the kinds of schemas that form in complex attachment trauma, those sometimes can be disconfirmed by the client's experience of the therapist. But schemas formed in the existential domain of life, such as the one I just illustrated, cannot. And there are other domains uh, where emotional learnings are formed that often cannot possibly be disconfirmed by the experience of the therapist. Um, 
Even in those cases, however, the client's positive experience of the therapist still can function as a catalyst, like I mentioned earlier in response to another question. The therapist's accompaniment makes it possible for the client to bring attention to and drop into experiencing emotional learnings that are so painful or distressing that the client could not possibly access them alone, right? So in these cases, the nonspecific common factors are crucial catalysts, but are not the substance of disconfirmation needed for the process to occur. Wow, I didn't know we'd get into all that, but... <laughs> But there you are. I hope that was clear enough to be useful. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and we've had a few questions about how um, certain modalities would fit into coherence therapy. So um, specifically mindfulness, self-compassion, and IFS, and how those may uh, fit in with coherence therapy. Yes. They, all of those blend beautifully together. Um, you know, I have colleagues who primarily... Uh, work from a base of the coherence therapy framework, but are also trained in all three of those, any of those, and bring those in whenever it seems to best fit the client's material. And I have colleagues who, for example, are mainly based in the IFS framework. That's their home framework, but they bring in coherence therapy methods and concepts when that fits the client's material. Either way, all of those blend and help each other wonderfully. Thank you. One more. Oh, we have time for one more. Sure. Um, I just summarized the last couple of questions since ah. uh, they were about various modalities. Okay. Um, um, someone asked, what will your webinar, if you could talk about your, your webinar that you're doing, what will that be focusing on and what will that be teaching about? Sure. Yeah. The webinar opens with uh, a, an hour and a half lecture that very systematically maps out uh, how memory reconsolidation works, maps out this three component process that I described briefly here, um, <clears throat> explains some of the memory reconsolidation research as it's relevant to psychotherapy, talks about the structure and substance of schemas, emotional learnings, and gives examples of them. Um, and then after that initial uh, lecture come, uh, a series of seven case examples, all illustrated with videos from actual sessions. So you really see the work being done. And uh, the case examples illustrate, uh, you know, pretty, pretty intense symptoms and, and problems of a wide range and, and shows the profound change, the transformational change happening <clears throat> in these heavy duty uh, sym symptomologies. Uh, in order, the seven cases are, I, I wrote them down here, uh, thinking that somebody might ask this question. Uh, the first one is compulsive inaction and underachieving. And that turns out to be based in uh, complex attachment trauma for that person. Next one is a person who presents a combination of uh, heavy depression, guilt, and complicated grief. Her, her five-year-old son had been killed by uh, being hit by a truck out in front of their home uh, eight years ago. And this, then the mother, my client, uh, is, is still as fully locked in depression, guilt, and complicated grief as, as ever, eight years later. Uh, next is a case of anger, uh, not Norina, a different anger of a different person. Next is a, uh, we see a family session uh, focusing on the 10 year old boy's chronic pattern of physical aggression with other children and getting in trouble at school for that. Next is a woman who presents a formless chronic Manhattan is saying hello to you if you could hear that. Um, a uh, chronic terror, a formless chronic terror that's often always with her throughout her adult life. That too turns out to be coming from complex trauma. Next is 
uh, a woman who's an aspiring stage performer and she's working on stage fright that is pretty much uh, preventing her current rehearsal from being effective. <clears throat> that turns out to be PTSD retriggering of a specific trauma from her childhood. And lastly is a, a client, a woman who describes um, current eruptions of what she called torturous feelings and sensations at different moments when she's at home. Harmless moments that re-trigger these uh, agonizing eruptions of these feelings and sensations. And that turns out to be uh, uh, flashback-like symptoms uh, based in uh, sexual molestation in childhood by her father. So that's, uh, that's a quick guided tour of what the six hour webinar will show you. Uh, well, Bruce, we're just about out of time. So I wanna thank you. First, before I do that, remind everyone that this webinar is available on demand in the middle of September for a month. And we're offering it along with the coherence therapy manual and an opportunity to come back for a Q&A after watching that on demand webinar. So we'll send you that information. Uh, Bruce, we, this is how we close. Um, we'll give you the second to last uh, chance to say anything, then we're gonna open the microphones because everyone could say thank you and goodbye. We always do this. I wanna thank everyone for joining us, whether you asked a question or not, it's great to see you and know that you're there. Thank Emily for doing a great job as usual. Bruce, second to the last word to you. Wow, this was my idea of fun. And I love seeing all of you on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us for this. Thank you so much.